What does filmed for IMAX mean? It isn't just a movie that'll look great on IMAX's screens. It means that hiding from a sandstorm feels like fear in every flicker. And every triumph is felt in every sound wave. And the things we've only imagined, you can truly experience those too. That's what filmed for IMAX means. Get tickets to experience Dune Part 2 now and IMAX's exclusive expanded aspect ratio. Age of Radio. A for Screen and Country Special Presentation The Hadric Files Episode 1 Conspiracy Hey, Brendan. Hey. Hey. We are back in the studio this week for the first episode of the Hadrick Files. This is a special presentation of For Screen and Country mm-hmm. and is a new ex- is an experiment that we're going to do. We've talked a little bit about it before, but let's lay it down right here right now. I just say first of all, it's going to be really weird because we don't have a live yeah. crowd like we usually do. So yeah. it's no, we are strange. back in the studio. Jim, are you over there? Well, I, 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 you know, I, I, I'm, I'm here by the door. Thanks, Jim. Good man. Yeah, you know that. So yeah, absolutely, we're back in the studio. Jim's watching the doors, just like old times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, what this is, Brendan, is uh, I had an idea uh, just to mix things up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna take a look at the life and times a little bit of uh, uh, Reinhard Heydrich who sometimes has been described as the worst Nazi, although he's in great company. Uh, <laughs> he uh, uh, Hitler himself called him the man with the iron heart. Mm. Is he also uh, the butcher of Prague? Yeah. He's also later attained the title of the butcher of Prague for his actions there. Uh, and he's not a real nice dude. So we're going to take a look at a bunch of movies that kind of deal with him ascending to that famous butcher, but also uh, the end of his life. Which was when the he best was assassinated. part of, Which was the best part yeah, of his life. Yeah, which is really the best part of his life, absolutely. Yeah. When he was assassinated by Czech partisans in 1942. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, assassinated. They they didn't kill him on sight, but they did wound him enough to uh, eventually he died. And just real quick, of, I'm Brendan. <laughs> and I'm Jason. <laughs> and this is for screen. And country. And continue, please. So... Yeah, we want to take a look at it, uh, at this guy because he's a fascinating character to me because when you think about the Nazi party, you think of a lot of bad people. A few, uh, yeah. Generally. <laughs> a few bad A few bad a few apples, bad apples. Say. Uh, Bad people um, on both sides, yeah, for sure. But there are, you know, there are differing levels of bad apples, certainly. Sure. Uh, uh, but I would put Heydrich up there. Uh, and, and, you know, to our, to our eternal uh, debt... To those Czech partisans, he was taken out relatively early in the war, um, but who knows how things might have gone differently if he had survived. Mm. But that's not what we're here to talk about. If you want to know about that, you can go read Harry Turtledove's book, The Man with the Iron Heart, which is about uh, if, if Hadrick survived and, and ran like a guerrilla resistance against Allied occupiers after the war. And, and that's not what we're here to talk about. Yeah, and spoiler spoiler alert for an, uh, an upcoming movie in this series, is that what that movie is based on? I don't think so, no. Okay, because there is one called that. Yeah. Yes, okay. yeah, because that was the thing Hitler liked to call. Okay. I don't know. It's a weird thing to want to call someone. It's like, oh, hey, man with iron heart. And he's like, hey, hey, Fuhrer. <laughs> hey, sir. <laughs> like, like Hitler hey, didn't sir. have a name. Yeah. Hi, Heil you. Yeah. What's up, Hits? <laughs> oh, that's why they called it NHL Hits in honor of Hitler. Oh, good um, Lord. Just, yeah, just, it was a weird choice. Just just uh, getting rid of everyone right, right in the first five minutes, yeah. eh? Yeah, that's why they didn't. That's why they haven't released those games since the late '90s. It was too too controversial. Yeah, all the swastikas were really weird. We, Wayne Gretzky posing mm. with them, just a, a bad. Yeah, uh, and and he did not authorize that. That was totally yeah. on the developers. Yeah. So anyway, so, yeah. So what? So we want to know a little bit about Hadrick. We want to get an idea of of what his character might have been like. And I decided that for the hell of it, I don't know. 
if Kenneth Branagh in this movie is doing a perfect Hadrick, but I like this movie a lot, and I figure it's a good place to start because it's based on real history. Folks, we are watching HBO's 2001 telefilm, Conspiracy, starring... Brendan? Starring a host of people, Jason. A host of... old friends. Some old friends. uh, Some old friends and a lot of, uh, I would say, almost all of non-German-speaking actors. This is very much in the same vein as if anyone has seen The Death of Stalin, where they said, just show up and do your voice. Like, just use your real voice. Don't care if you have a British accent. Don't care if you're American. Just talk. It's what we call the Valkyrie effect. You just you just give up on trying to do accents and you just act. Does it work? And Does it you know not what? work? We'll find out. Oh, it works. I mean, uh, I believe Chernobyl is also a series that takes the Valkyrie path, mm-hmm. and they just everybody just uses their natural voices to act because at the end of the day, it's a human story, and we all don't need to hear fucking silly German accents. Well, for ninety minutes, we'll we'll whatever. we'll certainly talk about this uh, this this yeah. style as we get into it. But yes. Um, as Jason said, the, the leading the film um, as I guess our our protagonist, our hero in this film, <laughs> uh, is uh, Kenneth. He certainly, I guess, he's the protagonist <laughs> technically. But it's uh, leading the film is Kenneth Branagh as uh, Reinhard Heydrich, and no, he didn't direct the movie either. He's just starring in it, which is a weird thing to say now. Um, well, yeah, I mean, he's always been an actor. I mean, he's done plenty of movies that he doesn't direct. These days, he tends to direct a lot of the stuff he's in. Did though. he direct Belfast as well? He did. And he also okay. directed all the Hercule Poirot movies that are coming out now. Mm. I really got to watch Death on the Nile. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't and seen I'm excited either. for a new one. I thought Murder on the Orient Express was underrated. Oh, it was fantastic. My wife and I went to see it in the theater, yeah. and it was, it was great. It's good stuff. Um, and if you don't, and, and bonus, if you if all that trial stuff made you hate Johnny Depp, good movie for you to see too. Um, so also in this movie, uh, Stanley Tucci as Adolf Eichmann. Uh, yes. I heard he was one of the good ones, right? <laughs> kids, 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 kids. You and your little Eichmanns, you're just all little Eichmanns, man. Remember that from the early two thousands? <laughs> nope. No, you didn't watch South Park, clearly. I did, but there I don't was a, that. There was a, I think there was a uh, professor in the states. Ward something or other. I believe he was a Native American professor, and he made some comment about referring to people as that were you know like little Eichmanns, mm. uh, as like people that went along with the government, and they used it on South Park, and it became kind of a meme. Yikes. Um, oh. okay. Anyways, Adolf Eichmann, piece of shit, yeah. uh, would die. Uh, w- w- one of the few people in this movie that would be executed for his crimes, if belatedly. Yeah, that's the the oh, that's the other thing we get to the post credit but we get to the credit title cards um we also have colin firth uh making an appearance as dr stuckert wilhelm stuckert Uh, so hot brendan he is so hot in this not the time jason not the time (laughs) (laughs) um ian mcneese as dr klopfer the state secretary party chancellery now now brendan have we seen ian mcneese in anything else yet i don't know because i i know this guy i'm i I love his work he's great i just couldn't well, no, not like in person, but I mean, in, have we seen him in any of the British movies we've watched? No, I'm Surely. just saying you said you, you said you love this guy, you know him. Yeah, so, I've seen I mean, him in a million things, but I couldn't name one. Okay, well, I'm looking right now, Jason, and uh, he is in Ace Ventura when nature calls. Okay, I might know him from that. You know what? I think you do because he's the guy that's with him the whole time, like the tubby guy. <laughs> it may be. It may be. Yeah. Um, also, he's, now, oh, he's, in, now, cons- he's, in, he's in Conspiracy. That's what you know him from. Sure, yeah, with Mel Gibson? No, this movie. <laughs> oh, oh. I, I was thinking of Conspiracy Theory. No, uh, um, I don't I don't see anything that he's... In, but apparently he's going to be in the new Napoleon movie, which we might talk about. Now, Brendan, before I say this, I want to say, like, um, I have no problem with Nazis being insulted. I think that Nazis should be insulted all the time, but I do find it extra funny that... And, again... Let me preface by saying I love Ian McNeese. Mm-hmm. I think he's a wonderful actor. I know what you're going to say, though. <laughs> but but I feel, as a fellow fellow fat guy, I could say, like, he's a man of girth. Mm-hmm. He's a big guy. Mm-hmm. He's got a big double chin. He's got a particular look to him. And I looked up a picture of the guy that he, actually, that he plays in this movie, and that guy did not look like that. No. And I felt that that was like, that, again, he's perfectly great for this role. He's wonderful, and he's such a dickhead in the role. He's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, but was I don't know if this specific guy had extra hate from whoever wrote this movie or cast this movie. He's like, yeah, let's put him in in this role and make this guy look like a schlub. No, I mean, I don't <laughs> think so. I, think he, I th- honestly think it's just a casting thing where they were like, we want to put him in the movie. I think he'd be good as this character. Fuck it. 
and he is good. I mean, at the like, end of the day, you need actors, like, and actors can act. And like, are there right? any? Scarlett Johansson told us actors can act. <laughs> I just want to say too, I don't think the people that are rallying behind an accurate portrayal of Doctor Klopfer are the people that they're worried about getting angry about this movie. Good um, point. So Kevin McNally is Martin Luther. Um, we have uh, David Threlfall, who the whole time I thought was Peter Capaldi until I looked it up. But David Threlfall is playing uh, Kritzinger, who is a very interesting yes. character in this movie. Um, uh, <laughs> we ha- and, and there's, a, there's a lot. Of, I'm not going to go through the whole list here, but I do want to point out making his, uh, making his film debut very briefly at the beginning of the movie and the end as a telephone operator is Loki himself, Tom Hiddleston. Yes. And I, I posit to you, fellow viewers of the Loki series, is this just part of the MCU? Is the sequel to this movie yes. in the MCU and it's Tom Hiddleston killing everybody in the room? Because I would love to see that movie. Make it happen, Kevin Feige. Well, you know what, Brendan? It's been a long, it's long been a rite of passage in Hollywood for, for young white men to uh, feature in a production where they get to wear Nazi uniforms. And so for Tom Hiddleston, that was just, that was just him becoming an, a true actor at that point. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a, okay. I never heard that before, but sure. Let's do that. Let's do it. And by the way, uh, speaking of uniforms, they all look fantastic in this movie. They, they, I think the attention to detail seems very good. And for, to my amateur eye, they seem to have nailed what German uniforms are supposed to look like. Mm-hmm. So this movie, Jason, um, is, uh, I mean, basically a play, right? Yeah. And, and, and kind of, I mean, we don't need to go through all the dialogue or anything, but like, tell me what, no. the, what this movie was, is essentially about then. So a little bit of history backstory. In, in, you know, in World War II, at the end of the war, the Germans made a very strong effort to burn every single thing that they had on paper. And they did burn a lot of stuff. And this was one of the things that they had made extreme efforts to keep out of Allied hands. They didn't want them to know about the, the, the scale of planning that was involved in the Holocaust. Like, it's one thing to find a death camp full of people that are being put to death. But then you see it written down on paper and realize that it's like an entire system. It's an entire industrial machine. That's a different, that's a different story. Mm-hmm. That's a different way that your country is remembered. So they tried very hard to suppress that. But thankfully... I guess in Martin Luther's belongings, of all the uh, people uh, assembled at this conference, uh, he had a copy of the document. Now, this document, I guess, was edited by Eichmann originally, so it's not like a, an uncut uh, <laughs> you know, recantation of what everything was said, but we know what happened at this meeting. So that was used as the basis uh, for this movie, mm-hmm. which, yes, is essentially a play. And I just want to point out, too, I didn't point out the director, but the director is uh, Frank Pearson. Um, oh, his name probably won't sound familiar, but he did direct the 1976 version of A Star is Born, and he also directed uh, Lakota Woman, Siege at Wounded Knee, which I believe is noted here as the first movie, um, with a first American movie to feature an indigenous Native American actress in the starring role, and wow. the third overall and first sound film with an entirely indigenous cast. Wow! So that's that Impressive. guy. So he's he's done he's done a couple of interesting uh, a couple of interesting notes in that's his in, uh, filmography. I can't speak to the, all the movies, but I can say after we watched the Fast Runner, it's in great good. It's in great company. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, so conspiracy. So yeah, so this is a this is a, right away. I think I'm going into this, and I'm like, okay, they have a they have a big hurdle right from the get go because we're going to be watching a movie. A feature-length movie. This is, you know, 90, 96 minutes or something like that. Like, it's, you know, the average movie length. Good, good length for the, what this is. But we're watching yeah, a feature-length a feature length movie about a bunch of evil fucking people. Like, no, yeah. no doubt about it. Just all, I mean, they're all Nazis. So, of yeah. course, the first difficulty, I think, lies in, like, well, we got to make this interesting enough where people are going to want to watch yeah. because there's really... There's no one to, like, root for. I mean, there is no. a sort of slight little tiny modified version of that, kind of, where you're not rooting yeah. for someone maybe, but you're also being like, oh, this no. guy's maybe not fully on board here. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be much of a movie if we spent 90 minutes with these guys cackling around a table. <laughs> yes, yes, we will destroy all of the Jews. Wouldn't be much of a movie. No. So they got to find a way to make conflict and tension. <laughs> and the conflict and tension, Brendan, comes down to the dissenting views between let's just kill them all or 
hey, why don't we keep them around for a while, use them for labor, and let them die off? And the quote-unquote good guys in this movie, which is Von Neumann and, and Kriksoff, Kritzinger. whatever his fucking name is, Kritzinger, are like, are like the moderate guys who are saying like, hey, if we just sterilize them, they'll eventually all just die off. We don't have to actually have to kill them all. Uh, and, you know, the other guys are making the point like, no, if we nip this in the bud now, it's a problem. Why should the German people wait an entire generation to have this problem solved? Yeah. Well, this character, Kritzinger, played by David Threlfall, again, who I totally thought was Peter Capaldi for a good portion of the movie. Um, I feel like it just when he was delivering lines, it just really reminded me of um, that movie we watched that I can't put my name on now where he was swearing a lot. Oh, and um. Uh, in the loop. In the loop. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, this guy didn't. This guy wasn't swearing. No, he wasn't. Uh, but like he was every just time he's getting very annoyed. Every time he spoke, very annoyed at Hadrick. Yeah. Every time he spoke, he just reminded me of him so much. But um, so they have. Yeah, you have this guy who's like he's certainly not uh, pro-Jewish, <laughs> but he he definitely is like you know uh, oh oh wait sixty thousand Jewish people a day like essentially is what they get down to when they do the math, and he's like. We're going to kill 60,000. And just the, I, I think just the idea in his head, take, take the Jewish equation out of the whole thing. I think just the idea in his head of we're going to kill 60,000 people a day does kind of get to him. Yeah, no, and and it does. Like that's the thing. There are a lot of people who are racist to the core, but still, the idea of killing 60,000 people a day, even if people they don't like, is still like. Well, maybe simmer down, dude. Maybe we don't quite go that far. Well, this is, this is the thing, Jason. This is my theory. Most racists are cowards. Oh well, no question. One hundred. I mean, yes. Uh, well, n- name a brave racist. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say there's any brave ones, <laughs> but I should say there's 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 ones that certainly would would kill someone. But most racists, yeah. I think, are cowards, and That's I think true. that they're all talk. Yeah, and I think a lot of them were in this room. I think a lot of them were in this room. I think, but mixed with a lot of ones that were not, were not all talk, unfortunately. Well, that's the thing. You got to think about like the Nazi Party's place in Germany at this point. So the Nazi Party started in like 1919, right? And it was a group of disaffected veterans, like like one of a, m- a million type of groups at that time in post war Germany. No These, real like, following for a things. long time, right? No. No, no, no more than any other one. Like I say, it was a bunch of, uh, of veterans that had nothing better to do. They got discharged from the army because the army had to shrink, so they couldn't keep jobs, and there was no work for them because the economy was fucked. So they got together and formed these quasi-military units and uh, uh, political parties. And one of these political parties was the Nazi Party, the National Socialist German Workers Party. And they were just a bunch of no-names uh, doing the same thing everybody else was doing. And then a guy named Adolf Hitler showed up to a meeting working on behalf of the government spy on them and i guess he heard what they were saying and thought these guys make a lot of sense and then proceeded to uh, use his talents to take over this movement now at first it just seemed like these were a bunch of fucking extremist nutbags in bavaria because they tried to they tried to take over uh, uh the, during the beer hall putsch in 1923 and it was such a fucking bungled mess and Hitler ended up in jail for a couple of years, which is a pretty light sentence for essentially trying to overthrow the government, uh, which is why I think at January 6th, they got to be like maybe a little harsher with their people. And remember what happened with Hitler. You got to put them in or they'll try again. Well, that's you the really thing, too. You got to lock them down. And, and I mean, it's just it's kind of chilling to think about like, well, they were such a joke at the beginning. And now, and then yeah. look at what happened. Like it's it. Oh. it, it if you not, if people are not careful, history repeats itself. That's all I'm saying. I mean, the the, the origins of the Nazi Party kind of remind me of, of like a well. I mean, I would say that more so that the Proud Boys are sort of a dime store Nazi Party in the sense that like they weren't they weren't really about winning hearts and minds so much as just beating up people they didn't like mm-hmm. and getting into fights with communists and shit like <laughs> street fights. And if they won the street fight, oh, you know. but the Proud Boys do have but, a hilarious initiation. Have you the, not seen oh, the the punching the punching in the cereals and then the, you uh, you can't masturbate. <laughs> I mean, I I think somebody said like this was posted on an actual website to like show how tough they are. I can't stop laughing. <laughs> it, it it sounds like something you would do at a university frat and then when you got out you would wistfully talk about but never meaningfully consider ever doing again. Yes. But yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. The Nazis were the uh, eating shit for a while. Bad. 
Yeah, they were eating shit for a while. But, you know, they continued to be thugs and do what they did. And they started getting more support and won electoral success. And by 1931, they had won not a majority of seats, but enough. Like 100 to, or something uh, like that. Yeah, to, to, to maneuver Hitler into power as chancellor. And then at that point, Hitler kind of just took over and began making Germany great once more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and so, this, this conference is in 1942, so we're deep into the war. Well, well, yes. And, For Germany, sure. We're three years into the war. Yeah. I mean, uh, have Americans entered at this point? Yeah. They uh, in nineteen December of nineteen forty one. Okay. So, so, so at this point, I would say that Germany is feeling the heat. Then. Yes, but they're not. I don't know how directly they're feeling the heat mid nineteen forty two because the U.S. is, uh, as far as Germany is concerned, the U.S. is fighting them in North Africa at that point. Okay. They're not in Europe. They're not because, uh, of course, the U.S. is focusing most of their resources, I think, at that time on fighting the Pacific War. Mm-hmm. Uh, but eventually, they do come to. Eventually, there's an agreement between FDR and Churchill and Stalin that boils down to Germany first. <laughs> yes. We deal with Germany first, and as soon as we're done with Germany, we'll go help you deal with Japan. And so that's what the United States did. Mm -hmm. And they were prepared to. They would have been there. The Soviets would have invaded from the north, I think, uh, and everybody else would have contributed troops to a land invasion of Japan. And, and, I mean, hey, thank goodness we didn't have to do it. Thank you, nuclear bombs. Yeah, thanks, uh, Oppenheimer. Um, But so in this movie, they keep talking about how I think they mentioned a few times just to put us into context, historical context, is that I believe they're talking about a kind of embarrassing defeat or or at least not not a not a very big victory in in the Soviet Union that they attempted or something like that to that effect. Yeah. So. So I'm really good at operation. Well, here you go, Brennan. So before World War II, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany had kind of come to an understanding. They had a secret treaty called the Molotov-Von-Ribbentrop Pact. And they basically agreed that they wouldn't fuck with each other and in resp- and, and that they would basically divide up Poland between themselves. So Nazi Germany, they invaded Poland in 1939 and started World War II. But the Soviet Union also invaded Poland as well because there were parts of Poland that wanted it back as its territory. Mm-hmm. Right? So, so this continued for a while and kind of kept the Soviets at bay for the Nazis. I mean, for them, this was actually, you know, in, I mean, obviously hindsight is 2020, but this was a very smart move for them because the Soviet Union, uh, if you're a realist, you can look at it as like, there's a lot of fucking people that live in that country. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, whatever happens, they've got a lot of people to throw at us. So, you know, cooler heads probably would have said, why don't we just keep them at bay? And I think that's what it partly was about. Like, keep them busy at bay, and they go deal with France, right? So in 1940, they invade France and whatever. And then they decide in 1941, they have a couple of options on the table. One of the options is invading England, you know, to invade the British mainland in something called Operation Sea Lion. Another op- op- operation they have on the table is invading their allies, or they're in the Soviet Union at that point. And that's what they decide to do, because Hitler was an idealist, Brendan. Hitler was a guy that said, the Slavs and the Russians are subhumans, right? So if we send our pure Aryan German stock of superior genetics into the Soviet Union, these subhuman mongrels will fold like the animals they are, Mm -hmm. and we'll just march into Moscow and take over, right? And so that's what they went in thinking they were going to do. It's why they went into the Soviet Union in summer clothes and didn't bring anything else with them, uh, thinking that they would be in Moscow and done with this job by wintertime and they wouldn't need it. Hmm. But it didn't work out that way because it turns out the Soviet Union are full of humans and they're just as ready to fight as the Germans were. Yeah, to defend their homeland, and it did. Yeah, it didn't turn out well for the Germans. No, no. So it didn't. So this and is. The, although I mean, you got to say though, like uh, as far as like a boxer putting up a fight, you got it. You got to give the Germans credit that they stayed in that long with the Soviet Union. Yeah, because Soviet Union had way more people than Germany. Germany, you know, with that Prussian tradition, had very strong military training, and had invested a lot in technology at that point, and so was ahead of the game on some of that stuff. But the Soviet Union, at the end of the day, in a war of attrition, Germany was not going to win with the combined might of the Soviet Union, the United States, and a good chunk of the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. 
Actually, part of, uh, sorry to get armchair general on you here, but what's an interesting part of the problem was is that when you think back to World War II, you think of how the Allied powers work. We all worked together. We literally worked together. We had militaries that were under commands of different nations' generals. You know, you're an American unit, but you might be reporting to a British general. That's how it worked. It was combined arms. Uh, and that's what our allies did to fight the Germans. But the Germans, again, probably for racial reasons, didn't engage with their allies in the same way. They didn't have Japanese troops fighting uh, in Europe to help shore up defenses. They weren't sending troops over to fight, you know, or sending, you know, German naval troops to help fight in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that. And that was to their detriment and to our advantage. Well, J and Jason, I just, um, I just want to say that uh, another, um, uh, uh, someone else uh, thought it was uh, really scary how far the Germans got as just the Germans, like just, just the yeah. Germans fighting other countries. And what one, one guy uh, famously was, uh, was concerned about that. And I just want to, just want to play a brief clip of that right now, if you don't mind. There is one country that worries me, though. Not Iraq, not Iran, not North Korea. The only country that really worries me is uh, the country of Germany. I don't know if you guys are history buffs or not, but... Uh... <laughs> In the early uh, part of the previous century, Germany decided to go to war. And uh, who did they go to war with? The world. <laughs> that had never been tried before. <laughs> and uh, so you figure that would take about five seconds for the world to win, but uh, no, it was actually close. <laughs> Then about, then about 30 years pass, and uh, Germany decides again to go to war, and again it chooses as its enemy the world. <laughs> Norm, always the astute observer of history. Yes. What's the thing? Like that, that's, I'm always worried about Germany. That's the funny thing to, to think about. Like, well, not the funny thing, but it's the thing to think about. Like Germany is... N not even close to the biggest country in the world, certainly. Not even close to the biggest military, but yeah, they, and like you said, not even, not even a country that was concentrating, they're like sending troops anywhere else, helping out the Pacific, nothing. They just defended their homeland or wherever they were invaded, and they did very well in the war. Um, but let's see. Let's... That's the thing is like, we're, we're, Brendan, we're all friends now, right? We're 70, 80 years on from the war. Yeah. We're all friends now. We all like making money. All of our rich people are extremely rich and friends with each other, you know, so it's all good. But um, let's let's get back to the movie. Just let me finish one sec. <laughs> just let me finish this bit. But Germany's always a country that it's like, I love you guys, but I always like kind of give them the side eye. It's always yeah, like yeah. I'm always just kind of keeping my eye on them just in case. You know, it's like, look, I understand. And, and Japan, I don't do that with Japan. I think Japan loves being in the world that it is now. It loves being friends with the United States. Mm. It's happy where it is. But uh, Germany, it's always like, mm, you guys could go pop off again if things go wrong. Yeah, you you always got your eye on uh, Angela Merkel. That's right. Yeah. But we're not here to talk geopolitics in Germany uh, itself. We're here to talk about this movie. Yes, so let's talk about it because again, this is very much like a play. Um, it's very much uh, it takes place in in one building, and actually, um, what's interesting is the shot of the building as uh, Kenneth Branagh or you know Hadrick is flying above it. When they show the building, that's that's the building. That's the real fucking yeah. building. And then of course, when they're in the Still building, there. of course, when they're in the building, it's a set. But um, the exterior shot is the real building. Um, yeah. So there's just a, it's it's a really good example of like uh, people using um, it's like power dynamics or people using their power to kind of get what they want and and it just from speaking I mean Hadrick positions himself in a way I mean he's the center of the table right he's yep. right in the center he's got Eichmann on one side he's got uh, everybody just kind of gathered around him and he makes it very clear like oh no no this isn't like a discussion like a strategy meeting I'm just telling you what we're gonna do like it soon becomes yeah. clear you think at first it's him showing up and being like come on I need suggestions Who, how do we kill him what do yeah. we do what do we do but really yeah. he's like no this is what we're doing I just need to know the how no, exactly. He's, he's like, this is what we're going to do. I need you all to know it. I need you to comply. And we need to figure out how this is going to go. And yeah, and that's the mistake that Kritzinger, Kritzinger and others that make that this is like in debate. 
yeah. what they're going to do, which is clearly not. It's a directive from Hitler. Mm-hmm. Now, there's historical debate because there's no direct evidence that Hitler ordered this, but uh, I'm willing to say that it's pretty clear he did. Uh, and, and he'd be smart not to write Wait, it down. there's no direct evidence that Hitler ordered the well, Holocaust? Like, we don't have a document. We don't have like a document, as I understand, that has like Hitler's signature saying, hey, go do the Holocaust. But... Um, and I, okay, and can I just say, Jason, that if I, I'm yeah. I know the Holocaust happened, I'm well aware that it took yes. place and it was a horrible tragedy. Yes. But if there was a document yes. that said, "Hey, go do the Holocaust," signed Adolf, I would say that that is a fake document. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you might be right. As the Holocaust, I think, was like a post-war term, <laughs> at least in wide wider usage. Um, but yeah, no, the, I don't think we have any direct physical evidence that he ordered it. But it seems pretty obvious to me why, why, because why would his nation pour so much time and money and effort that could have been poured into the war, mm-hmm. and he not know about it? Well, and like, it, is he that fuck? I mean, he was a dumb guy, but he wasn't that fucking stupid. Well, they're they're and it's it. You really start to realize, like, yeah, they're putting all these resources into this. They kind of it, it really crippled them during the war. They're kind of crippled yeah. by their own blind racism. Well, I mean, that's the thing is like it, it, from a purely realistic perspective, you think about it. Like if if the Germany that went into World War Two was not a Nazi Germany. Well, number one, if it was a, not a Nazi Germany, I suppose the chances that it would want to get immediately back into a war with the rest of the world was minimum would be minimal. Yeah. But if they did. And they weren't something based on racial supremacy. Think about the talent. Think about the advantage they would have had. Imagine if Albert Einstein had been working for the Germans in World War II. Yeah. Because he was from Germany, right? Imagine what he could have done for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, all those Jewish soldiers from World War One that had combat experience that could have been training soldiers for them, sent to camps and killed. Imagine if they were in the field doing their jobs. Like... If Germany really was all about taking over the world and not just murdering Jews, they could have done it, maybe. Maybe. If they hadn't had this fucking holding them back. But there's also a, a strong argument that no matter what would have happened, Germany would have eventually lost because Germany could not maintain a war of attrition with the rest of the world essentially against well, them. Well, and as our good friend Norm MacDonald just said, Germany went to yeah. war with the world. <laughs> the world. I mean, obviously, there was, there was Axis countries allied with but, them. But again, they were not... They were not running an allied uh, force no. like the allies. But I mean, were. I mean, mostly the world, <laughs> aside yeah. from a couple of countries. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it. And and what this movie does that's really interesting is like they don't. Now I know this is based on the fact that they found Eichmann's essentially essentially his minutes from the meeting the minutes of the meeting um, yes. which i <laughs> i could just see the minutes being like okay be racist okay be very very be very racist be more racist <laughs> but um i don't know why i did that with a um a different accent than german but let's not worry about it but um <laughs> no what i think is really uh well done with this movie is it kind of creeps up on you like a horror movie at one point because they're talking mm-hmm. about they're they're being very vague with their language at first, or Hedrick is at least. Mm. He's saying like you know evacuation. He's saying uh, we get rid of them. He's saying that yeah. we we uh, need to move them away. And then eventually, uh, one of the well, guys the, that's the, a, the initial. I was gonna say, Brendan, the initial thing is he's like we're we're changing our policy from uh, 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 emigration to evacuation. And one of the guys is like. Wait, where are we evacuating them to? Well, well, I was gonna say, <laughs> what's the difference? Like, well, well, I was gonna say, one of the soldiers, one of the guys who's a, a you know, who's executed several Jewish yes. people, said, "Now hold on, um, I myself and many others uh, is said that we had evacuated six thousand Jewish people when we shot them. So are you saying that that is evacuation? Because language is important here." And I think we need to really understand what we're saying. And Eichmann goes to cut him off by saying, like, you know, that's not important, blah, blah, blah. And Hadrick says, yes, that is what I mean. And it's like you could tell, like, the whole – like, it's like like the shoe drops. Like, the whole room Mm. takes on a whole other tone. Like, obviously, these are all horrible people, and some of them have killed – like these poor Jewish people on the streets and all that shit. Like it's not like it hasn't happened yet. But for the meeting to yeah. suddenly go from like we're we're um, dancing around it to like Hadrick just saying yes, that means execute. Evacuation means execute. That's what I'm saying. It's a big uh, leap. And that's what was. 
I, I think the directness was shocking to them because, you know, in a regime like that, it is doing such horrific things. That's par for the course. That's mob talk. It's you. You don't say it outright. You dance around the subject. It's also politics. You know, it's like you know. You know. It's like, hey, why don't you go take care of this? What do you mean take care of it? I mean take care of it. Just take care of the problem, and then you go take care of the problem however you see fit. You know. And maybe that means kill the guy. Maybe that means beat him up. I don't know. Well, it, but the problem gets taken care of. It's also political language too to not be direct, yes. right? That's. I mean, how oh, many times? And how many times have you seen? Somebody asks a question, and the politician does everything but answer that question almost every time. Yeah. Doesn't matter yeah. who it is. Doesn't matter if it's Barack it's, Obama it's, or well. Doesn't matter if it's Barack Obama or Donald Trump. Although Donald Trump just ooh. flat out refuses to even address it. But you know, that that's the thing in in the in the pre-Trump era. Yes, the politician dancing around a direct answer to a question was a classic move and has been advanced by many uh, professionals over the years. But in the post-Trump era, it it just does to just lie you don't need to dance around anything you just lie about it you just fucking say what you want to say yeah. what you want people to think and you move on and you don't worry about the repercussions mm -hmm. well i think because po smart politicians try to maintain like some fucking like rhetorical backdoor to be like hey now i didn't say that but dumb people see, like trump just don't care jason anytime anytime I, th I think about this i think about that time during one of the debates where and i mean i'm not a huge fan of the guy or anything but when chris christie just destroyed uh Oh, what is his name? Republican nominee. Nominee. He's been on CNN a bunch. Jeb Bush. What? Jeb Bush. No, no, Jeb no. Bush. Oh, Ron Paul. Uh, Marco. Mark. 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 Marco Rubio. Marco Rubio. He was basically saying like, now he's gonna say this, and Marco Rubio said that, and he said, "Yep." Now his next talking point, he's gonna say this. Oh, look at that, folks! I got him again. <laughs> it's just like because well, Christy knows how the games play. Yeah. It. It was. It was. Again, no huge fan of Chris Christie, but it was like watching a, a doctor, <laughs> like a surgeon, just yeah. pulling no, apart. Watching a professional who is good at his job, yeah. uh, uh, just taking you through it. Like, like him or not, Chris Christie, he's he's a politician's politician. Yeah. Um, Except for all the corruption, which is really, which I is, mean, that makes him even more. Well, I was say that doesn't make him a politician. What are you talking about? Um, let's can we talk about let's talk about the performances because I think Brenna obviously is at the center here and he's just he's just yes. using his British accent like I said nobody's doing anything any kind of crazy like oh she's she's a cop. like no one's doing any kind of silly German accent but Brenna has like a steely presence like his eyes yeah. are sharp and like he just has an intense look to his face I mean. Bran is smart. And he's read the history. He knows the reputation that Reid Reinhard Heydrich has. I honestly don't know much about Heydrich's personality. I don't know how he was in um, everyday life. Mm -hmm. uh, but clearly here, regardless of whether it's true or not, Brana has chosen to portray him as yeah, very steely, very confident, very quiet, very charming. You know, uh, yeah. very. He speaks in hushed tones a lot. He never once raises his voice throughout the movie. That's I. Th and yeah, that makes him scarier. That strikes, yeah, it makes him scarier. But that obviously is a deliberate choice against his reputation as one of the most brutal and awful and terrible Nazis, mm -hmm. the architect of the goddamn Holocaust. And that actually comes through in kind of the banality of the whole thing. Like when they start going through and talking about the details of like, okay, so first gen mixes, here's what we're doing. And then second gen mixes, we do this, but we have exceptions for this. Oh, yeah. And it's like, it's so, oh, it, not only is this the banality of evil, this is the bureaucracy. That's what I was going to say. Evil. It's so, gotta, yeah. It's so bureaucratic. It's like, it's like yeah. rival, rivaling the bureaucracy in Brazil, for God's sakes. <laughs> and as as they point out at one point in one of the, I guess, one of the few really f kind of funny moments of the movie when he goes, it's like we're, most of us are lawyers here. Come on, hands up. How many of us are lawyers? And like half the room sticks up their hands. Yeah, including Hadrick. Yeah. So they <laughs> they know that language matters. Right. And uh, uh, especially um, uh, Colin Firth's character. Uh, uh, what's his name? Stuckert. Okay, Colin Firth. The, Colin Firth Stuckert might be the scariest person in the room because he is. Hadrick he, is, is Hadrick is not Hadrick is smarter than a lot of them. He knows what he, he knows what he's doing. He knows how he's gar garnering support. But Firth, like Stuckert, is someone who it, the movie does a does an interesting thing with him because if you don't know your history, like me, he comes in and it's Colin Firth. 
And I'm like, oh, it's Colin yeah. Firth. He's got it. Yeah, sure. He's like, Love he might him. be playing a Nazi, but like, maybe he's going to be a voice of reason. And he is for a little bit, you think. Yeah. But then when he, when he reveal, when someone says like, oh, he's a Jew lover. And he's like, excuse me, let me explain about myself. And you're like, oh shit. Not only is he a Nazi through and through, he understands that the, the dumb stereotypes that they do about Jewish people are ridiculous. And he's saying like, no, we need to accept our enemy as smart and cunning. And we yes. need to we need to take them out cleverly. And you're like, fuck, this guy is scary because he doesn't see them. He sees everyone as a threat. He's not just like, yeah. oh, this will be easy. This will be simple. Like, imagine, I think if, imagine that guy in Hitler's seat. I think the war might have yeah. gone differently. Well, that's it. You wonder, because that's, that's the thing, is when you have this kind of racial supremacist bullshit, you know, you, you tend to get into one of two major views. You Either the Jews are essentially goblins, they're like, they're, they're you know, they're primitive and they're evil and whatever, but they're essentially a pest. Mm -hmm. uh, convert to, you know, Colin First's view is that they're they're supremely cunning and trying to take over the world and we have to be on our, our highest guard against them. Yeah. Right? I mean, his views are obviously still very racist and stereotypical, but yes. he is not. But, but he also is. Also more practical. Yeah. Yeah. Like he is, he is saying that they are an actual threat, which is. 1,000 yeah. times scarier than just like a propaganda yeah. video. But it's also a thing. It's like you, if you, you should always take your enemy seriously regardless of how serious they are. Yeah. Because if, if they are serious, you need to be ready. <laughs> because there's a moment where Kritzinger um, and, and him are like the two main dissenting voices. And Kritzinger at one and point. Newman. Uh, what? And Newman, the no. uh, the four year plan guy that insists on introducing himself to everybody. Right, but I mean, Kritziger and Stuckert are really the two biggest ones, though. And you think they are like yeah. dissenting, um, but as soon as Stuckert does that, they do. The movie does a clever thing where they do cut to Kritzinger during that, and he, you could definitely tell like a cloud has come over him. Like, oh, maybe he's not as much of an ally to me as I thought he was. <laughs> you know, because uh, um, Stuckert is very much talking about like how he's like. Uh, you know, we need to do this smart. We need to do this clever. We need to do this. We need to do this more efficiently. I'm a lawyer. You can't. We can't have all these convoluted rules about mixed marriages. You need to decide what's what and decide it now. He does think that the 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 genocidal solution, I think, though, is not going to work. I think he does make well, that clear because because Brendan Stuckert's main view on things is the law. Now, Stuckert was Dr. Stuckert was the author of the Nuremberg Laws, which comes up in the movie, which was the, the they were the racial laws that the Nazis set out during their um during their reign. So, he was intimately familiar with how that worked, but he was a guy again being a lawyer. He understood that they had to make it legal. Like from his, he was an idealist, I guess in that sense in in terms of like we need to work within the realm of the law because that's what civilization is. We're all white men. We all follow laws. We have to do what the law says. Now we can we can work with the law and we can come up, but we as the law is, we cannot pull this off. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, uh, obviously, hey, Drake is taking a more brutal, realist assertion of well, we can just do it. But what are they going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And Stuckert's like, no, we have to, we have to be within the realm of the law to make it legitimate. Yeah, that, and and again, another thing that makes him even scarier. Mm. Whereas you have someone yeah, like he's still like everybody. That's the thing is that is that there are no. I mean, again, we said this earlier, but there are no good guys here. There are no we have people that dissent for for the minorest of reasons and maybe a a slight distaste to the idea of murdering 60,000 people a day in camps, but also for practical reasons, whether that's forced labor or, uh, uh, you know, just let them, just let them die. Don't waste now, the time. Were, just let them die. You know, there were claims that Kritzinger, there were claims and there were, there were, there was some evidence that Kritzinger specifically tried to resign his post immediately following this meeting. There were some, there were some, I did read some claims and now I don't know how, I don't know if it's true. I don't know, you know, what evidence there is, but there is some evidence that he did attempt to leave his post. And a lot of people have said too, that if you read through the minutes, um, there is some evidence too, that maybe Kritzinger wasn't grasping fully what was going on here. The, the gravity of what they were about to do. Um, now I'm not saying he's, I'm not saying he's an innocent person by any stretch, but I'm just saying like, I think there was some reluctance on his part. Again, he, he seems like one of those racists that's like, you know, I, I'm fucking racist as shit. 
y'all. But like murder, I don't know. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing, again, because, like, you can be a racist without being a genocidal maniac. You can still be a yeah. white supremacist without specifically wishing the death of everyone. You just don't want them around or to have any rights. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, it's just... And, and, and then you got, like, Ian McNeese as Klopfer, who's almost a cartoon character racist. Like, he yeah. talks about wanting to, he's... like, rape the Jewish women. Yeah. Like, he's like... Yeah, he does. Which, you know, okay, Making can I jokes. just say this is something? If you're a racist, right... And yeah, if you, if you're a racist, all right, now stay with me. <laughs> and you're walking around like your little racist self, okay? And you might be thinking I'm yeah. a racist with this accent, but I'm not. But if you're sure. a racist and you're like, you know, fuck these people aren't people, they're subhuman, whatever mm-hmm. you want to think. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't having sex with them <laughs> wouldn't that be like something you wouldn't want to do? I don't understand these like racists that are like I'm going to rape okay. this person. I, th- I think two things come into this. Okay. One is the creed of pussy's pussy. I mean, for some people that the racists alike, that might be the idea. But also you got to think like a lot of racists are literal animal fuckers. So I guess True. the attempt to fight the tent, you know, to being able to fuck another human, regardless of their race, well, at least not an animal or it's a better animal. I mean, I'm, I suppose that they see the, uh, a certain group of people as animals and they are already animal fuckers. I guess it, it lines up. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I just, so I, just, I always they... thought that was weird. I don't know. I always thought but, that was. I mean, but to be real, I mean, I think it's a power thing. It's because rape is a power yeah. thing, right? So what, what a better power thing than some white guy raping a black chick, right? For that, for that racist white guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's just that this movie is like it's so designed to. Because if it was any other movie, if it wasn't a historical movie, it's designed to make you like be like, all right. When does when does this guy come in and 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 take a stand? When does someone come in and say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, what are we doing here?" And like I, like I said, it's sort of kind he's, of he's, he's fucking Jimmy Stewart walks in in like a like a Wehrmacht uniform. He's like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, listen, fellas, you you can't be doing this." I mean, well, we're all humans at heart, aren't we? I I just want to hey, hey boys I I I I tried to do that. I try I tried to bust in that meeting in real life. You did in Vonsi when you were a pilot. I, I I heard some chatter and and I landed on the ground. I bro- I busted in that conference. I I said, hey, hold on there, fellas. Now uh, just wait a second. Now, uh, uh, Jewish people, you say, and you say Nazi people. You know what the same word repeats in both of those people, people, and 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 and. and 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 uh, uh, Hedrick, with a twinkle in his eye, kind of gave me a look, and he must have been a hell of an actor because I said, I think I've changed history. And I left, and boy, howdy, don't you know what the Holocaust still happens. Oh, I'm sorry about that, fellas. I tried my best. Well, we thank you for your service, Jim. Uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'm going to go back and watch the door. I'm pretty good thank at that. You. That's why you'll... You you were great at that, and that's why you'll always have a job here. You're good at it, and you've served your country. Well, I've been working on the railroad all that long time. Ah, oh, he's a good man. That guy killed so many Nazis. He, I love him. He did kill a lot of Nazis. He made up for it, for yeah. sure. Um, for sure. Yeah, so... Uh, oh, one th- another thing that really sticks out in this movie is Hadrick's strategy in... The people that he feels are, and this is the way, this is something the movie does. The people that he feels are possible dissenters or reluctant or maybe swaying, you know, away from him. He meets with them individually during the downtime of yes. the meeting. And he basically. Classic management technique. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, this guy knows what he's doing. Um, as evil as he is, he knows what he's doing. And at one point, he says to Kritzinger something that was very. Very haunting is that he says, like, you know, you're a very powerful man and you would be very difficult to take down, but not impossible. Yeah. And it's again, essentially never saying, raising his voice, never sounding mean, just smiling and just yeah. saying it matter of fact. But essentially saying, get on board or I'll probably have yeah. you killed. Yeah. Or at least stripped of all your like, power. That's something that has happened many times over the years by 1942. That's how the government operates. I mean, dude, I was surprised to learn that the guy, uh, the, we see the character Martin Luther, who's like the undersecretary and SS liaison, um, yeah. got thrown into concentration camp at some point. Yeah. 
Now, I mean, yep. not for doing anything noble, but he certainly got thrown into a concentration camp showing that, for, showing that you know, anyone could really come get, yeah. get uh, punished. Well, I mean, the biggest, uh, I think, example the Nazis made was the Night of the Long Knives in 1934 when they, when they purged the SA. You know, the SA was a massive organization and, and they're street fighters and, and been around since, you know, the old days in the Nazi party. And they fucking purged it. They shut it down. They killed most of the leaders and integrated anybody who was left into the SS. And it was like, that's that. The SA's gone. No longer a problem. Yeah. I. There's a, there's a line at some point that also gave me chills, Jason. And, and somebody says it, and I don't remember who says it. Maybe you can help me. But somebody says... Mass slaughter leaves a bad taste. Yeah, I don't remember who said, said that, but so yeah, that's a... flippantly. Yeah, mass slaughter leaves a bad mass taste. Mass slaughter. And it's like in that understated British manner because the... these people are all just using their own normal voices. And Jason, we can't say flippant without talking about the discussion, the very casual discussion of the gas chambers. Yes. Yeah, and how they um, well, and how they initially use carbon monoxide gas in sealed trucks, which, when it comes to murdering a lot of people, that's a pretty ingenious little operation because it's such a uh, like it's convenient. You just you take a truck, you put a you put a thing on the back of it, you seal a bunch of people in. The more the better because it works better if you got more people crammed in there, and then you just pipe the tailpipe in there and you drive for a while, and then everybody's dead. Well, and, the f- and you dump them in a hole. And, and they're having a good laugh about how saying, like, you know, you put yeah, them in oh, and all pink. they come out pink. Yeah. And that's a big uh, a big laugh around the table. <laughs> and that's another telling scene, too, because the, you, if you notice that uh, Pearson, the, Frank, the director, Frank Pearson, makes a point of, of showing that not everyone is laughing at that joke. Hmm. There's still some people that are like, whoa, we, where, where have we gone? <laughs> where have we gone to yeah, well, in this conversation? Yeah, we... I mean, you, you literally could be a person being like, look, I'm all for killing, or look, I'm all for, like, uh, d- terrorizing Jews, but this is a bit far. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I think I'm, I'm, uh, understand the letterbox comment now that I read that says, this is basically 12 angry men, but make it anti-Semitic. Branna is essentially yeah. the uh, racist Henry Fonda of this movie, slowly uh, convincing the dissenters to come to his side. Yeah. And, and and let's not forget about – we haven't really talked much about the Tooch. Yeah. Uh, but is Stanley a, Tucci plays Adolf Eichmann, and he's fantastic. And, and, he, and his is such – is a much more subtle performance, yeah. right? Like, he, he's, he's, he's not immediately, apparently, like, outwardly no. evil, but he's just as evil as anyone else. Oh, yeah. No, he's the boss, uh, Hadrick, but, but – uh, Eichmann's the numbers guy. Eichmann's the guy that's kind of making sure everything is running smoothly and that their plans are being put into action. And making sure they have delicious and, food. Among other things. I mean, yeah, you know, the guy knows how to host a party. Let's give him that. I mean, let's give, but, Eichmann, uh, let's give Adolf Eichmann one oh, thing. Oh. The guy can host a party. The guy can host a party, sure. But he also was the guy that carried the torch after uh, Hadrick's assassination. This was the guy that, that led the, essentially ran the Holocaust. He was the guy that was b- uh, behind it all. Like, I mean, he didn't, he just, I mean, I'm not saying like he did everything himself, but he did direct it and run it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, kind of to Hadrick's vision. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, they did it. They did it. They managed to murder, you know, millions and millions of people. Mostly Jews, but lots of other people too. Um, a super uh, and, and tying into Eichmann a little bit because he talks about uh, at one point Hadrick asks him, uh, "Why didn't you get some lovely piano music, uh, you know, to bring in?" And he says, "Like you know, uh, Eichmann gets all uh, like bothered, worried that he didn't do." It, and he says, no, "I'm just kidding. Like it doesn't matter." But then he says something about like a piece of music that'll it'll oh it'll tear your heart out. And I wrote down, what an oh, yeah. ironic thing for a Nazi to say that this classical music will just, oh, bring you to tears. Like, yeah. what? Well, because then there's, then that gets called back later in the movie where he puts it on and the, I think a junior officer is there. And he's like, does it tear your heart out, Lieutenant? And he's like, oh, it's or not Lieutenant, it's the jan- or the it's like the servant. Mm-hmm. He's like, does it tear your heart out? And he's like, oh, it's lovely, sir. And he goes, I'm like, fucking puerile Schubert or whatever. <laughs> like, he clearly doesn't like it. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it yeah, it's, it's, um... It's that's uh, that's just such an uh, an interesting kind of through line because they talk about it a few times throughout, 
And then the la- the last thing, and, I, and if you have any other big things to talk about, please tell me. But the last big thing, big thing that I have, I want to mention is um, Kritzinger's story that he tells. Hmm. At, oh yes, that, that, that he tells Hadrian to uh... relays, right? About the about the man that basically, basically hates. His, I, now let me just try to remember. This essentially he hates his he, father. He, yeah, he had an abusive father who eventually left, and he hated this guy his whole life, and he was raised by his mother, whom he loved dearly because she took care of him, protected him, whatever. And then, and then she dies, and at his and at her funeral, he can't cry. He can't bring himself to cry, despite the fact that he loved this woman, his mother. She was the rock in his life. He can't bring himself to cry. But then many years later, his father who lives a lot longer, but eventually, like, you know, gets old and decrepit and dies, and he's still a piece of shit, and he goes to his funeral, and he's inconsolable. And he can't stop crying. And it's because he's realized that the object of his hate, that one thing that's kept him going, is no longer around anymore. And he realizes at that point that there's nothing left. And he cautions, or is it Hadric? He basically was cautioning Hadric against the idea of, like, letting their hate become their only thing. Because once, so once they kill all the Jews, then what? Yeah. What's left? Well, that's what he's saying. He's like, if you let yourself be defined by your hate, what are you going to do after that? Yeah. And, and yeah, exactly. You let yourself be defined by your hate of of a certain group of people, and now you've gotten rid of that group of people. So what are you defined by now? Yeah. Like, and it, it's it's. I mean, it's a great point. <laughs> it's a great point yeah. that he makes. And from a terrible person to an even worse. From person. a terrible person to a worse person, and it's like, and that again just makes me think though. Like, I don't know if Kritzinger. I know that he was a racist. I know that he believed in the purity of blood and Aryans and all that shit, but I don't know if he wanted to be a murderer. I don't know. Like, there was there was people that joined the Nazi party because it was politically expedient, and there was people that joined the Nazi party because they were believers. Look, I don't think the kid and... In, those are different people. The kid in Jojo Rabbit didn't kill any Jewish people, okay? Confirmed. Saw the movie. Mm, did the fat kid kill any Jewish people? <laughs> no. No comment. <laughs> great movie though if anyone hasn't seen it oh great movie fantastic Rabbit, movie fantastic Taika Waititi yeah. Oscar nom baby but Jason do you have any other big things you want to talk about before we get into our bits and our bombs what were we talking about right before this last bit uh the classical music right I had something to say about that so just to go back to the bit about the music for a sec, that's actually an interesting thing that just kind of came to mind because one of the things that was interesting about Hitler as a person was that he loved art. Oh, yes. Despite the fact that he was mediocre at it, he was a man who loved the arts and spent a lot of money uh, making sure that during the war that the arts continued to exist. He rebuilt theaters, would make sure that shows were playing. And it sounds like I'm lionizing this guy. I am not. This was, uh, as much as I love the arts, this was extremely stupid on his part because it diverted more resources away from the war. Why rebuild the fucking theater when it's probably just going to get bombed again? Maybe wait till the war's over. Um, But because of Hitler's love of art, I think that there was a lot of pretentious art loving in the Nazi elites because they thought it might be a way to endure themselves to the Fuhrer if they expressed, oh, I love classic German art or theater or paintings or, or I love reading Gath and all this other literature mm-hmm. they're all being fucking suck ups because they knew what kind of government they were working and they realized the snakes they were working with anything else Jason you're a snake Brendan wow, I'm, I don't, I'm waiting for the day you come for don't me don't like uh, that you just referred to a bunch of Nazis as snakes and then called me a snake that's a, that's a real uh... yes Brendan but I'm a mongoose and one of these days, this mongoose is going to do whatever a mongoose does to snakes, to you, the snake. Oh, no. Tickle attack. Um, so we're going to take <laughs> a uh, brief break at this point, and uh, we're going to hear from some ads from, from some sponsors, and uh, we will be right back. Well, hi. This is your old pal, Jimmy Stewart. A fellow has asked me to come over from the door just to say uh, uh, you should check out AsiaRadio.org. That's a, that's a hell of a sight. I'm going back to the door now, fellas. Goodbye. Bits, 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 bombs, 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 bits, bombs, bits and bombs, bits and bombs with Jason. Go. Very respectful. 
Very respectful. Thank you. Swastika in the title at the beginning. When it says conspiracy, there's yeah. a swastika in the O. I said, oh, sure. shit. But you understand the old marketing uh, 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 wisdom that uh, if you put a swastika on a movie or a book, you up its sales by quite a significant percentage. I don't like any of that. No, but, man, if you go look, look, go go to the store sometime and look up Ken Follett's World War II books. They all have fucking swastikas on them. And I'm sure they're entertaining books, but throw a swastika on the cover and people are going to have their eyes caught by it. I like how the film wrote in something, because at the beginning, a lot of them are saying, obviously, they're greeting each other with Heil Hitler. They're all doing it. Yeah. And then um, the film writes in a line where they're like, okay, okay, we all know Heil Hitler. Let's just not do it anymore uh, so we can just save ourselves some time. That- that again speaks to the realism of Hadrick. Again, Hadrick is is not an idealistic character in the sense that, you know, he's all about practice, practice and results. Yeah. And it's like maybe the maybe the objective murdering all the Jews of Europe is an idealistic objective, but he's willing to take that idealistic objective and approach it practically. Mm-hmm. And that to me is again reflective of him being like, look. We're all going to be here. All respect the fear. We love the guy. We love we love you, Andy. We love you. We love you. We Mark. love the fear. We love you so much. We love him. We worship you. We we think you're infallible. But for the sake of expediency, we're not going to hail you every single time we walk into the room. So uh, he's not here. So let's all just pretend. Let's just you know what Daddy doesn't know can't hurt him. So let's all just you know. Well, you know what, Eichmann, you go ahead when you when you edit the transcripts. Make sure you add in Heil Hitler to the beginning of every phrase. <laughs> Just so if he reads it, he, he, you know, he's happy. Yeah, just just write it in with marker. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, the fucking the worker breaks a plate, and, and, and Eichmann immediately establishes himself as a very bad man. It's it, not the Holocaust that makes him a bad man. It's the fact that this guy breaks a plate, and he's like, make him pay for it. Mm. <laughs> I have a question for you, Jason. Um, I wrote down a couple things that I wasn't sure about. Is there... And if this is going to take a while, don't worry about it. But is there any way no to problem. summarize real quick what um, Newman kept talking about when he kept mentioning the four-year plan? What is a four-year plan? Well, when I hear a four-year plan, I think of some. I think of something like the five-year plan, which was the you know what the Stalin and the, and the Soviets did in the '30s. Like, it's the idea of in a in a planned economy of having like kind of a specific plan for how things are going to go. And in the case of this four-year plan, it says on Wikipedia here, the four-year plan was a series of economic measures initiated by Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany in 1936. So it's economic. Hitler placed Hermann Goering in charge of these measures, making him Reich uh, plenipotentiary, whose jurisdiction cut across responsibilities of various cabinet ministers. So it's an economic thing. It's about kind of uh, deciding the economy and how it's going to go in advance. That's like with communist systems tend to be centrally planned, and clearly the uh, uh, Germans also had similar ideas of planning the economy even if it wasn't like all state owned gotcha yeah so uh just a, it's economic shit and jason my other question is um is there like some tension between the ss and like the regular german officials because there seem to be in this movie oh, yes. they, they represent that okay so you've got kind of three factions i imagine you've got the civilian government which at this point are all nazi party members right mm-hmm uh, and the civilian government really isn't that separate from the military. But then you've also got the Wehrmacht, which is the, the Army, the here, the um, uh, Navy, the Kriegsmarine, and the Air Force of Luftwaffe. And they are the traditional German armed forces. They are not inherently Nazi. Like, they are not Nazi party apparatus. However, then there's the SS, the Schutzstaffel, which was originally established as Hitler's bodyguard. Uh, but it quickly expanded to become, and especially after the SA was cleared out in the Night of the Long Knives, the sole mil- uh, paramilitary arm of the Nazi Party. So essentially, you have two, because uh, you, you have the Waffen SS, which is the the armed division of the SS, which is is essentially, uh, you know, they're military units, right? They the training guns, all that sort of stuff. But rather than being loyal to the German state, they are personally loyal to Adolf Hitler. Mm-hmm. So throughout the course of the war, there was a lot of tension between the Wehrmacht, who rightfully thought that, you know, the war was their job, because that's what they existed for. Uh, But the SS was very much muscling in and, you know, and was being given plum jobs and and had a reputation, deserved or not, of like the elite of the elite are in the SS and that they're the best of the best and whatever. But 
I mean, really, it was it was a part, you know, it was an effort on Hitler and the government's part to have troops that were loyal to the Fuhrer and not to the state, because you have troops like von Stauffenberg uh, and his cohorts who eventually kind of get tired of Hitler and try to kill him in the July 20th plot. And, you know, their reasoning, they're loyal to the German state and not to Hitler. Mm -hmm. But uh, SS generals would be less likely to do that. Okay. Yeah. So does that make sense? Yeah. I'm no expert. Should we do Valkyrie? <laughs> uh, it'd be interesting. Okay. Um, I don't know. It seems like initially, like a lot of them don't actually know why they're there. Yeah, I did get that vibe. Well, and I mean, it does. They don't feel... know that they're there to solve the Jewish question, I suppose. And even though they're not really, I mean, it does also feel very secretive in general. I mean, they're talking about like oh. how these are your notes. Remember, memorize them. Uh, we're gonna send you a, a secure copy of the minutes after the meeting. Um, we're going to burn the minutes. Clearly, that didn't work, though, because Americans found them in Eichmann's well, personal one files. Copy. One copy. and the only no, evidence that no, this not meeting happened. Not Eichmann's, in Luther's, pers Luther's oh, personal Oh, I thought files. it was Eichmann. Okay. No, it was Luther's. But, um, yeah, one copy. And that's the only reason we know what happened at this meeting. And, we, and, and because of that, I think we know that this was where the Holocaust was essentially, if not conceived, at least dictated. <laughs> Uh, love the actors. Uh, two actors that stand out to me: uh, the gentleman that plays uh, uh, Heinrich Mueller, who's the SD, the SD Heinrich Mueller, not the other Heinrich Mueller, who's a general. Are you talking about uh, Brendan Coyle? Yes, Brendan Coyle, of course, of Downton Abbey fame, plays the uh, uh, Butler Bates, or the sorry valet. Bates is a valet. He may be a butler eventually. I don't know. I didn't watch that late, but he was a valet. He's great. Love the guy. And then, of course, the uh, the other guy um, who played Sir Alistair in uh, Game of Thrones. Okay. Uh, I don't remember his name. Owen Teal? Is that it? He's in there. Uh, I don't see. Yes, as uh, Dr. Freisler in this movie. Yes, he's Dr. Freisler. Um, let's see here. Uh, some lines that stuck out to me as I was watching this movie is one, we cannot store these Jews. Mm. Like, they're, like, they're objects. They're, they're cargo to be stored. They're not people. It's just so casual. And then they talk about, like, they're, because, you know, in, I don't think in Judaism theology there's really a hell or a heaven. It's kind of the idea of, like, paradise on earth in Israel. But uh, one of them says, do they even have a hell? And then uh, Kitz, uh, sorry, Hadrick responds, they do now because we provide mm, it. Yes, that was a very, yes. Which is true. Um, uh, also, I wrote, even in, a, even in a room full of scumbags, Klopfer is particularly a scumbag. Oh, like I said, <laughs> he's a cartoon racist. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, my, one of my notes simply says, that food looks good. Yeah, it does. Well, I mean, that's the thing. These guys, like, the war sucked for Germany because Germany, you know, can get blockaded pretty easily and all this stuff, but the top guys ate well. Yeah. You know, they got to preserve German culture in their bellies. There's a there's a character, and I think it's – and I apologize, folks. There's so many characters in the in this movie, but there's a character who um, – the one who brings up the whole idea of, like, evacuation. What does that actual, actually mean? And he says, "Oh, the uh, the major." Yeah, he says at one point, "Studying law has made me distrustful of language," and that's why he brings yes. it up. Which is like, yeah. And he, and he says, "I think it." He goes, "I just think it's helpful with what words mean." It, which is, you know, we need to know what the words mean. We, we don't need to be fucking you mean euphemisms. Euphemisms. If we're going to talk effectively, and because he's a soldier, right? Yeah. He's right to the point. He knows what's up. He's a realist. He's like he's like Hadrick in some way, and that's why when Hadrick gives him that direct, yes, that's what I'm talking about. That's why it shocks everybody else, because mm -hmm. they're not used to that. They're not used to getting the truth said out loud by someone like Well, Hager. they're used to po politicians. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, so uh, another gross scene was where they're they're sitting around. Well, in the whole movie, they're sitting around, so forgive me. But uh, they're sitting around uh, during one of the breaks, and they're laughing about, uh, like, sterilizing people. And it's like, oh, give me a sterilization injection. And then I'd be like with the ladies, like, hey, no problem. Mm. And then and then and then what is a good clock for again, special kind of scumbag. He's like, ah, oh, you don't even need to get it. You just need to tell them you had it. <laughs> yeah. Like, like oh, I said. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then and then, then a great line, because then they're arguing. Well, great line. They're arguing about sterilizing them because I think Kritzinger and a few other people basically have the view it's like if we sterilize them we can use them for labor in the eastern front and 
they won't be able to continue their lineage. And then the old people we can send into the ghetto and they can just die of disease or whatever. And then they're gone. And, you know, Hadrix basically like, well, no, uh, because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what they could do. We don't know what they could get into. Death, he says, is the most reliable form of sterilization. Mm -hmm. And that's that's fucking dark. It's true. but fucking dark. The movie's a bit dark. Oh, it's dark and racist. I mean, the, the other line that gets me, it's like so like 40s racist sounding. He's just like talking about the Russians. You know, he's like, so long as he has a bottle of vodka to suck and a domestic animal to fuck, the Russian will live in his own shit happily. This is his politics. Mm. Yeah, and then 20 million of them gave their lives fighting the Germans, but they still won. Mm-hmm. Oh, and the 60,000, again, the other line, 60,000 Jews a day, he says, like, in awe. Every day, up in smoke. We can achieve that. Imagine. And then they all start pounding the table, you know, like, oh, like they're fucking, like they're fucking British Parliament banging on the table. Like, blah, 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 blah. yes, 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 yes. A triumphant German vision, he says. Let us astonish Charles Darwin with our... Social Darwinism and evolution of cutting out the 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 deformed and defected with our yeah. Surely Charles Darwin Jew. would have been a Nazi had he been alive. Yeah, well, that's they kind of misunderstood his <laughs> his theories were uh, talking about biology and not um, human social uh, existence. That's all I got, Brendan. Anything else on your end? Uh, no, I don't have any other uh, bits and bombs, but I do have one little piece of trivia. Um, so apparently the produ this production uh, used almost a theatrical performance style during shooting. So it's basically meaning like the performers stayed in costume and character from the start to the end of each day of filming. Um, a set was used with solid non-moving walls and ceilings to reinforce the reality of the setting and eliminate any delays for changing camera or lighting setups. Uh, the action was filmed in extremely long sequences, sometimes 20 pages or more of a script at a stretch, which is unusual, of course, for a movie. Um, however, many of the actors, as you might have guessed from their nationalities, had a Shakespearean background. So having to memorize a, a large amount of dialogue was certainly not something foreign to them. Um, they, uh, the movie was shot in uh, Super 16. Um, this was needed because of the longer film magazines available for those cameras and also the smaller size, allowing the cameras to get in very close to the, to the performers um, while they were sitting around the conference table. By, by the way, I had no idea this movie was shot on Super 16. It looks great yeah. for a movie shot on Super 16. Um, now, this is a TV movie, so obviously there are no Oscars or BAFTAs, but I did look at... Emmys? What? Emmys? Well, it did win Primetime Emmy Awards for the writing, uh, for the screenplay, oh. and also for Kenneth Branagh's performance. Yeah. And it also won a Golden Globe for Stanley Tucci's performance. Nice. So there you I go. mean, think about it. Like, 2001, Brendan, this was, I believe that was what? It was two years into the Sopranos run. This was like when HBO was really starting to become the prestige channel we know it as. Mm. And this, I mean, look at the assembly of talent in this thing. Like, this was absolutely a classic HBO prestige thing. Probably, you know, didn't cost a lot of money to shoot. Maybe cost a little more money to pay everybody, but yeah. uh, was was wonderful because of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this movie... Um... I mean, I don't obviously I don't have a budget or a box office, but uh, that's that's pretty much all I have actually. So, yeah, Jason, uh, our first chapter of Hadrick is is our introduction to him. Of yeah. course, we do get the uh, post movie title cards explaining what happened with every single character, and I won't get into yes. all of them. But as we, I thought it was maybe. I thought it was maybe a bit disrespectful to play Louie Louie under the under those credits as they explain what happened to these Nazis. Um, but you know what? It was still I love the song, so I was happy to you hear know, it. You know, just to be clear to everyone, that's not what happens. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> they actually play uh, 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 Welcome to the Jungle. So um, I, I'm not going to get into all of the title cards, but like obviously most of them didn't go to jail or didn't go to jail for very long. No. Uh, maybe I think two of them were executed. One died in a car crash. 
um, that uh, uh, there have been some speculation that maybe the Mossad actually arranged that car crash, uh, but that was never wouldn't blame that him. was never. Um, substantiated in fact they said they don't think it happens because the Mossad would surely just take credit for it if it happened <laughs> so yeah that's right they they were happy about killing Nazis when they which, had the you know hey kill as many Nazis as you can go for it I'm all for it um but yeah so I don't uh I don't have a lot of other a lot of other things about this movie but uh yeah I'll just ask you Jason and you've seen this movie before tell us yeah, uh tell I us have. what you think as an introduction to the the horrible <sighs> human being that is Reinhard Heydrich it's it's a it, well first off as a movie I hate to say this about this movie but I love this movie I think it's fantastic I think everybody in it is great and it is a wonderful document of this horrible thing and 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 again the I, I keep saying it but the banality of evil how banal it is how it's this is like this is this is the equivalent of some corporate meeting at a retreat or a corporate retreat like you go there you sit around a desk you got fucking paperwork you you know you're, you're going over the numbers and you're going over the plans for the new year and everything like this could be any company it's just you put them in uniforms and they're talking about people specifically jews and their deaths and here we are it's like it's fucked up it's it's just how easy it is to to go down that road if we let ourselves and this movie reminds me of that and i like this movie because yeah it's basically a play it's it's all takes place in this house uh the performances are everything the costumes are great this movie is a fantastic it's it's not very actiony but I mean, very. It's not actiony at all. No, there's nothing. But if you're interested in, if you're interested in this period of history, this is a pretty important thing to know about. And I don't know if there's too many movies about the Von C Conference, so this is the one to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Brendan, as my first time watching it, I mean, it was very compelling. Um, as just a weird word to use, maybe, but it was very compelling. I mean, mm. I did get a. A pretty big glimpse into, like you said, the banality of evil, which is maybe the scariest thing about this whole movie, is how it feels like it could be any other meeting. Um, but you, once you realize kind of what's going on, you're like, oh, shit. Like, the, a lot more is going on. A lot more is happening here, um, unfortunately. And uh, But, yeah, it's, it's, it's gripping. It's gripping. And you have all these great performers. And I, I do think it does make it less distracting that none of them are trying to do a German accent. I think it's it should be, like you said, it should be less about that and more about the content of the movie, mm-hmm. more about getting across how this fucking meeting happened, almost word for word. Like, they base this on the actual minutes yeah. of, the, mm-hmm. of the conference. So a lot of this is just based on what was written down. Yeah. Um, so the things that they're talking about are probably the things they were talking about during this. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's... it's, it's uh, it's a really great um, movie about a horrible event in history. So there you go, Jason. Yeah. But Jason, we just took a brief respite from the list uh, this week. Yes, uh, we did. We did. But And we will come back to this at some point in the future, and we'll let you know what we're going to talk about you know, the week before it happens. Yeah. But uh, every now and then we're going to do this. It's just nice to mix it up. And I, as I've said, our plan is to kind of look at his life and more so the end of his life and how his death is portrayed on screen as well as some of his crimes. And just, I just thought it'd be interesting to, you know, look at one guy and one subject in a different cinematic context, you know, because I never get to do that. I didn't go to film school. So (laughs) this is, you know what? This is film school, baby hosted by me, professor fucking Jason. Okay. Not, Not professor McLeod. No, I'm Professor fucking Jason. And that's what you say. You say, Hey, professor fucking Jason. And you say, that's fucking me, bud. Yeah, that's fucking me, bud. I'm Professor fucking Jason, and we're going to talk about fucking movies, bud. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, as Jason uh, becomes, I don't know what he's doing, uh, but... A stereotype. A stereotype. As, uh, as we will return to this, actually, pretty soon. But um, next week, we are going back to the list. We are staying in this era, though. We are staying in World War II, uh, much like yes. this week, because we are going to be talking about uh, the, the only... Paul Verhoeven movie on the list next week. We are going to be talking about the... Robocop? The, not Robocop. Not the famous World <laughs> War II movie, Robocop. We are going to be talking about the 2006 film Black Book, directed by Paul Verhoeven. I've not seen this, and I do love me some Paul Verhoeven. Yeah, I, I'm curious. About, I've been curious about this one for a while. Now, just to um, make this clear to everyone, this is Black Book, uh, the Paul Verhoeven movie, not Little Black Book, the Brittany Murphy romantic comedy from the early 2000s. 
Um, no, this sir. It is also not is also not the British sitcom Black Books. No, and uh, is which is very funny. Also, but it's not, not this. the Jungle Book. Just want to make that clear. It too. Is no, it is not the Jungle Book. It is not uh, Black Swan. It is not, not Black Swan. It, it, it is not uh, Black Beauty. It um, is not Book Smart. It is uh, not Book Smart. Right out. It is not Book Club. The next chapter. No, it is not Book Club. The original one either. No, is that what that one first one's called? Book Club, the, the original book club, one. The original one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Black Book 2006. Um, simply, uh, simple summary here: In the Nazi-occupied Netherlands during World War II, a Jewish singer infiltrates the regional Gestapo headquarters for the Dutch resistance. So there you now, go. Now, folks, just just a little historical heads up: If you remember, Canadians liberated the Netherlands in World War II, and they love us for that to this day. There you go. So yeah. we will talk about that next week. Paul Verhoeven, I'm sure it's wild. I've heard uh, that wild, it is wild. Wild stuff. I, I'm telling you, I've heard that it is wild. And uh, the funny thing about Paul Verhoeven, not a huge fan of fascists. So I think we're going to see some good dead Nazis next well, week. I mean, I've seen Robocop. I've seen Starship Troopers. I think yeah. that's a fair assessment. Uh, I also, think... I hope one of the German soldiers goes, I would buy that for a Reichsmark. Yeah, it's probably, it's probably going to happen. Yes. Um, but we'll talk about that next week. But until then, Jason, uh, you can find us all over the place. We're on, we're on all the social medias. You can find us on Facebook. Just search for us. We're on Twitter at FSAC Pod, as in for screen. And good try. Podcast. Uh, we're also on all the podcast apps. You can, of course, find us at our home base, ageofradio.org slash for screen. And good try. And Jason, what about you? You can come over and follow me on Twitter at Jason D. McLeod. On X, you mean. Sorry, you can follow me on quote-unquote X, the future. Uh, you can follow me there at Jason D. McLeod, M-A-C-L-E-O-D, and see as I destroy my own psyche by trying to argue with anti-trans people and various right-wing idiots. I did enjoy reading folks, that thread, though, Jason. Thank you. But, folks, if you if you have a view... You know, everybody's entitled to their views, and that's cool. I mean, you know, the world's a different place, and there's lots of different people. But if you have a view, a strong view, and you find that view being shared by fascists, you may need to pull back, take a look inside, and take a look at yourself, and think about what you actually believe, and if that's what the thing is. You need to take a look inside. Always, always do that. It's a good, that's good advice for all things in life. Think, dig yourself. Would a fascist do this? And if you think yes, then don't do that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe take a second look at yourself. That's right. That's right. Well, there you go. Wise words, Jason. Um, but as we, uh, as we round the bend here, as we go back to the list next week with black book, Paul Verhoeven, I'm very, uh, in- intrigued to see what that is. Um, I just, uh, I have to say to you, just these simple words for you, God save the king. And for screen and country, I'm Brendan. And I'm Dr. Bill Cosby. Mm. Nope, he's Jason. Bill Cosby's not here, guys. No Bill Cosby. <laughs> oh, he just went out the door. Whoa, well, Bill, Bill, you, you, you can't come in here, are you? You've been banned for quite a while. You've been banned since uh, letter part six. Wow, well, see, even before the allegations. Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, oh, long before, yeah. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to let him in after that, Travis. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Why can't you relate yourself? What we say ain't for yourself. Can't have stories like your hair with Jackson left inside your head. Nuts, bugs, nuts, bugs, nuts, bugs, fuck off. Nuts, bugs, nuts, bugs, nuts, bugs, fuck off. If you're not fight, get out of here. You ain't no better than the bouncers. We ain't trying to be police, so you ain't the cops and ain't anarchy. Nuts, bugs, nuts, bugs, nuts, bugs, fuck off. Nuts, bugs, nuts, bugs, nuts, bugs, fuck off. Take that jump point, what a man. They fight each other, the police say wins. Stop your backs and try your home.